Welcome to MeetsPad, a platform dedicated to sharing breakthrough knowledge that is accessible to the meets industry. On each episode, we will hear from meat specialists and professionals to talk about numerous topics in meat science, including animal welfare, meat production, meat quality, food safety, and so much more. Hello, meat folks. Welcome back to the Meats Pad podcast. This is Phil. I'm flying solo. Uh, Francisco is out making the world a better place for us meat enthusiasts. And uh, so today um, we're going to be visiting with Dr. Mindy Brashears from Texas Tech University. Um, uh, first off, thank you and, and welcome. Oh, well, thank you so much for having yeah. me. It's my pleasure to be here. Well, it's an, it's an honor to have you. Um, for those who are unfamiliar with Dr. Mindy Brashears, um, you have a you have a very lengthy uh, portfolio, and and maybe it was maybe it was all by design, or maybe maybe some serendipitous uh, uh, actions happened along your time. Um, but uh, you know, for those who do not know you, can, maybe you can maybe you can start to uh, maybe just explain a little bit about some of the food safety work you've done in the past, and that how that has led to some pretty cool opportunities recently. Sure, um, I I do have uh, I have many titles. I keep saying I need to get rid of some of these, and then they just keep adding on. <laughs> but um, I uh, have been a professor in food safety for my entire career. I've worked in academia. Uh, I went to Texas Tech uh, for my undergrad, and then went to Oklahoma State for my master's and PhD and started my career at the University of Nebraska and while I was there I was a professor and but I was in extension and research and I was I had the opportunity to work across the state with the meat processors and it just happened to coincide with the uh, 1997-98 when the new HACCP regulations were uh, rolling out and I worked with all the small and very small meat processors across the state very closely mm -hmm. with the uh, meats faculty at University of Nebraska and really loved the job, you know, and I started integrating my research with my uh, extension work, you know, solving problems by collecting samples in a plant. Sure. Um, the opportunity came up to go back to Texas Tech, and it, it was a hard decision. I mean, I love Nebraska. It was great, but ultimately, I went back to Texas Tech and uh, went through, you know, my career, the whole process, of, and did research, uh, still working on applied interventions, but also focusing on the pre-harvest side. Um, I, uh, a little known fact maybe is that I am a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors. And so I have, okay. I was somewhere between 26 and 29 patents. Uh, we have two spinoff companies. Uh, and through all that work, we developed a probiotic that could be fed to cattle that killed E. coli. Uh, it's widely used in the industry. But now we have developed a new probiotic. It's called Probicon, and it kills Salmonella, E. coli, Clostridia. You know, we made, you know, version 2.0, I guess, My so to gosh. speak. Yeah. And uh, so I have, you know, those companies that, that I'm, I have a role in. We, you know, I don't have to manage that on a day-to-day -day basis. But, you know, um, a few years ago, I got a text, and it was from a congressman's office, Mike Conaway. And it said, would you uh, consider being undersecretary or, you know, your name thrown in the hat for undersecretary with the next administration? And, in USDA. Yes, yeah. at USDA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, undersecretary of food safety, probably, you know, everyone in the world of food safety knows that's the highest ranking food safety official in the U.S. And it's like, oh, yeah, sure, I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> so nonchalant. Yeah. Well, no. I'll, oh, yeah. Now, let me clarify. <laughs> I will I will be considered, you know. Yeah. But I never thought, I'm like, they're not going to pick me for that job. But I'd be like, oh, I was considered for this job. Uh, along the way, uh, I just never said no. You know, they're like, oh, you want to go to the next level of vetting. And then the next thing you know, you're going through FBI interviews oh and security clearance <laughs> and at the White House <laughs> and meeting with Secretary Purdue, you know, and ultimately a Senate confirmation hearing. Um, that whole process, you know, that that could take it. That could be a whole other uh, podcast. But finally, ultimately went into that role, um, had the opportunity to work with the best team ever at USDA, all the other undersecretaries, Secretary Purdue um, overseeing the food supply uh, chain and, you know, inspection for meat, poultry, and processed eggs. Well, then COVID hit and, you know, managing the food supply chain during that, it kind of throw, you know, threw everything 
in a crazy motion, but, you know, I was honored to be able to do that, make sure we had meat to eat and safe on everyone's plate. I uh, got through that, and now I am back at Texas Tech. I am uh, the Associate Vice President for Research there. I also have my faculty role, so I can continue my research with applied food safety, studying antibiotic resistance, developing enumeration for salmonella. Now, integrated in all of this is also a passion for food security. I have done quite a bit of international work in Latin America, uh, Mexico and Honduras primarily, and the Bahamas, Latin America and the Caribbean, and then quite a bit of work in Australia and New Zealand uh, for those different operations. So I have lived a wonderful life so far and, you know, had my family to support me. And, you know, without them, I wouldn't be where I am today. Well, you... It, <laughs> First off, thank you for your service at, at oh, USDA, um, you're and, and especially during some um, definitely turbulent times yeah. um, in in the world at the at the moment when you were at the time when you were still there. Um, and and thank you for your efforts with uh, with HACCP implementation and, and and intervention. And and for those uh, listening out there who maybe uh, need a little bit of a history lesson. You know, 1997, 1996 was when the mega reg was implemented. That's the that that was when HACCP was uh, became mandatory for nearly all food process uh, meat processors in yeah. the United States. Um, and and for those who um, uh, maybe are are a little bit younger and and just kind of take HACCP as this, you know, it's it's a thing we do. Um, that was a big deal. Back then. It, was <laughs> yes. a, it was an enormous deal, and and it was necessary. It was needed. Um, and since then, we continue to bolster the safest food supply in the whole world. That I that I regularly say anyway. And 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 I would I would fight for that that statement if anybody ever contradicted me. But um, in the United States, we certainly do have have one of the safest food supplies in the world. And um, and a lot of it has to do with the work that was done to implement HACCP. And, and so that's interesting to hear that that's kind of when you dove into the whole process. <laughs> yeah, you know, and I look back on my career and, and everywhere that, that I landed and what I was doing, it really prepared me for the job at USDA. I didn't even know that, but, you know, I was being prepared every step of the way. So not that I knew everything. There was a lot to learn when I got there. <laughs> There's always something to learn. <laughs> you know, and, and that, well, I, I'll, I'll get I'll I'll, I'll um, wax philosophically here for just a moment, but it's interesting how life sets you up for your upcoming challenges later on. Yeah, and, and so <laughs> boy, were you were you prepared? Um, if anybody can be prepared for a call <laughs> from a congressman to become the most highest ranking food safety expert in the in the in the in the nation. So. Well, well, I always tell uh, my students uh, I always in our family we say say yes to new adventures. Well, I'm like, but I didn't know that was going to apply to me. <laughs> so. that's, that's fantastic and, and it's fantastic that you were willing to take on those those opportunities yeah i don't want to call them a... challenges i want to call, call them <laughs> challenges opportunities, opportunities <laughs> and, and lots of growth lots of growth <laughs> yeah. lots of opportunity to continue to learn right right um tell us a little bit more about your humanitarian efforts because that sounds fascinating well, um, that's really been, you know, one of the things that I still hold near and dear. And one of the reasons why I really wanted to go back into academia, um, I just think it's so important to uh, educate the next generation of leaders for the industry. And I always tell students, I'm like, you can go to just about any university that have, you know, meat science, food science, food safety programs. You're going to get the same information, the knowledge. But when we have students in our program, we want them to have an experience. So they get to go to the industry and go to plants and, and have a lot of interaction with each other and team building. But, and you know, this things have been on hold because of COVID, but we built programs uh, in Mexico and Honduras. And, and I'll, right now I'll talk specifically about Honduras. Uh, it was another one of those moments. I had a student who had come to Texas Tech from Honduras, and she said, I want to take you there, you and faculty, and just show you different ag industries in Honduras. So we were kind of doing a tour of the country, which was wonderful. I love to see, you know, ag operations in different countries. Well, um, I was at the hotel on the front desk called, and they said, oh, there's somebody down here that, that wants to talk to you. And I called up another faculty member, Mark Miller. I was like, somebody's in the lobby that wants to talk to me. <laughs> Would you come with me, you know? And, and it was a gentleman, and his name was Ricardo Paz. 
and he said, well, we heard there's a group of Texas Tech people here um, in animal science, and we want you to rebuild the cattle industry in Honduras. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Okay, with <laughs> yeah. a stroke of your wand. I'm we'll, like, we'll, we'll, okay, <laughs> I'll get right on that, you know. <laughs> Well, and it's another one of those things, you know, say yes to new adventures. And uh, I remember the next day driving around and you're like, well, so there were many situations. A lot of the cattle had moved out of Honduras, you know, really, uh, you know, north Nicaragua, even all the way up through Mexico. It kind of correlated with the drought in the U.S. And, you know, a lot of cattle had to be, uh, the herds had been harvested and, you know, it just kind of pulled uh, the, the livestock herd north and just other things from drug trade to, you know, lack of regulation, everything else. So, um, and then, you know, they had a unique situation. They, the grass, you know, grass fed obviously usually in these countries, but you know, their rainy season was short and the grass was low quality. So it's like, we need a cattle feed. And so it's a very long story. This is like a 10 year project, but we brought in ruminant nutrition uh, people. We brought in, um, I work closely with my husband. He uh, works in, you know, culture, food security, center. he's in leadership development. So okay. he had another aspect and uh, we developed a cattle diet uh, where it's basically based on palm kernel meal. Palm kernel oil is one of the primary exports from Honduras. Okay. And then you have the meal that's usually just put back in the, you know, in the field around the trees. And there wasn't a market um, poultry litter and, mm -hmm. you know, sugar cane mm -hmm. at the most basic level. You know, it, I would, a ruminant nutrition people would be like, it's much more complex. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we, you know, we developed that diet, uh, started uh, some, some operations, had small feed, feed yards, you know, pens. We would feed them. Um, you know, looked at getting them to at least like 900, close to 1,000 pounds before harvest because they were harvesting, you know, six, 700 pounds and just oh not very much meat on the carcass no. when you do that. Wow. Uh, we worked with a major facility in Honduras and the government, and we were able to get their equivalency reestablished so they could export to the U.S. Okay. and in the region, um, looked, did food quality or meat quality studies with the population to develop new markets, um, and then even worked on the genetics of the cattle. I still have really close ties there. I, you know, I was in Honduras when I got the call when they said, okay, we want you here in D.C. next week to begin the job. And, you know, and I was like, oh, no, it's my last time in Honduras. I haven't been back there. So, you know, that's been almost four years ago. But I look forward to the day when we can go back and continue to continue that work. Uh, we developed, a, you know, a, a commodity group, all of those things for the support. But more importantly, and the most important thing is we have a very strong relationship with Zamorano University. And that is in Honduras. And for people who aren't... Um, familiar with it. It is an ag university and they are very hands-on. Uh, I think when they're a freshman, they're given an acre of land and they have to do something with it and make a profit. No kidding. <laughs> you know, oh, so, wow. I mean, it's very intense. And so we developed a program and it's called the Sower Scholars Program. And that's like sower, S-O-W-E-R, you know, mm -hmm. reaping and sowing, right. sowing and reaping. And uh, it's sustaining our world through education and research. And we bring those program uh, students in. They become sower scholars, and this might be for a semester as an intern. And we might give them passive training, yeah. or you know, teach them different skills uh, before they graduate with their bachelor's degree. But then um, we get a lot of those students that come to grad school. So uh, if you look at our graduate student population, many of our students come from Zamorano across Central America. Now we would love when we think about the concept of um, sowing and reaping, mm -hmm. you think about, we would love for them to go back to their, you know, home countries to build the intellectual capacity. Yeah. As much as we love to go and help and, and serve the, the community there, we can't be there all the time. Oh. So you need people there. And, and we have students that have built their own facilities there, developed consulting businesses. So, so yeah. Uh, oh, and the, a, a really cool last little point, the gentleman who came to the hotel, Ricardo, he uh, 
whenever I began, you know, he was working at a, a slot, um, feed yard and the feed yard had closed. He'd lost his job. You know, he had gone to Florida State and been in the U.S. Um, well, by the time I ended up in my job as undersecretary for food safety, mm -hmm. he was basically the equivalent in Honduras oh, wow. in the government. Wow. So, yeah, wow. it's like those, you know, those things, it, it's crazy how those things happen. Yeah. And uh, one of the very first things I got to do at FSIS was sign uh, the paperwork to approve Honduras for um, for export of poultry to the U.S. and got to call the Minister of Ag and Ricardo was on there. It, it was just you know it's a cool opportunity, how and a cool rewarding. experience. Well, and how rewarding how 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 the whole cycle has, has yeah. come about and yeah it is. Well, and and you're you're not only helping um, revive an industry there and and feed more people and it, you're you're providing jobs back to these agricultural based folks that um that needed that and 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 finding better uses for the resources that they have about so right yeah that's, well that's yeah really we couldn't cool. go in and say oh go feed corn a corn-based diet right, because yeah, they don't have yeah, that right. you know you had to be very innovative well, and, you, but that's yeah. the beauty of, of ruminants and cattle especially is <laughs> yeah that, i mean you can you use the resources that you have available Right, right. So, so yeah, it's a very rewarding opportunity. And the people that I've been able to meet, uh, the students I've been able to mentor, and, you know, then they, they always come back and give back. And I always learn way more from them. And, and they don't probably don't even realize that. Well, for those out there listening, you, you know, this is a perfect example of you, 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 you get back way more uh, than you give in many cases when you do give, and, yeah. and, and especially give of your time, your resources, your knowledge, and et cetera. And so, um, this has been fantastic, and I really appreciate you sharing your story. Um, hopefully, the folks out there, um, if you have any questions, you know, send it send it to us here at Meatspad. But uh, um, this is the great thing about the American Meat Science Association is that we do have the membership network. We have access to folks like Dr. Brashears and sometimes Dr. Brashears herself, um, and and uh, um, and we'll continue to um, just continue to make the world a better place, uh, food safety wise, but then also mm -hmm. humanitarian wise. Oh so yes, really for sure. That. It's all about feeding the world. That's right. That's right. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. I enjoyed it very much. All right. <laughs>